Good morning everybody, hope you're all well. Uh, please don't mind Dobby. This is actually the second time that I've tried to record this and I had to cancel the other one because she put her bottom in the way and I didn't think you'd want to see that. I've learnt my lesson from yesterday so hopefully this video will be getting up earlier. We are reading The Iron Man written by Ted Hughes, illustrated by Chris Mole and published by Faber and Faber. And today we are reading chapter three. You'll remember chapter two ended by the farmers burying the Iron Man alive. <coughs> What's to be done with the Iron Man? Looks very sad down there. So the spring came round the following year. Leaves unfurled from the buds, daffodils speared up from the soil, and everywhere the grass shook new green points. The round hill over the Iron Man was covered with new grass. Before the end of the summer, sheep were grazing on the fine grass on the lovely hillock. People, who had never heard of the Iron Man, saw the green hill as they drove past on their way to the sea, and they said, Oh, what a lovely hill! What a perfect place for a picnic! So people began to picnic on top of the hill. Soon, quite a path was worn up there by people climbing to eat their sandwiches and take snaps of each other. One day, a father, a mother, a little boy and a little girl stopped their car and climbed the hill for a picnic. They had never heard of the Iron Man and they thought the hill had been there forever. They spread a tablecloth on the grass. They set down the plate of sandwiches, a big pie, a roasted chicken, a bottle of milk, a bowl of tomatoes, a bag full of boiled eggs, a dish of butter and a loaf of bread with cheese and salt and cups. The father got his stove, going to boil some water for tea, and they all lay back on rugs, munching food and waiting for the kettle to boil under the blue sky. Suddenly, the father said, That's funny. What is? said the mother. I've, I've felt a ground shake, the father said. Here, right beneath us. Probably an earthquake in Japan, said the mother. An earthquake in Japan, cried the little boy. How could that be? So the father began to explain how an earthquake in a far distant country that shakes down buildings and empty lakes sent a jolt right around the earth. People far away in other countries feel it as nothing more than a slight trembling of the ground. An earthquake that knocks down a... Uh, knocks a city flat in South America might do more than no more than shake a picture off a wall in Poland. But as the father was talking, the mother gave a little gasp, <gasps> then a yelp. <gasps> the chicken! She cried. The cheese! The tomatoes! Everybody sat up. The tablecloth was sagging in the middle. As they watched, the sag got deeper and all the food fell into it, dragging the tablecloth right down into the ground. The ground underneath was splitting, and the tablecloth, as they watched, slowly folded and disappeared into the crack, and they were left staring at a jagged black crack in the ground. The crack grew. It widened. It lengthened and it ran right between them. The mother and the girl were on one side, and the father and the boy were on the other side. The little stove toppled into the ground, growing crack with a clatter, and the kettle disappeared. They could not believe their eyes. They stared at the widening crack. Then, as they watched, an enormous iron hand came up through the crack, groping around in the air, feeling over the grass on either side of the crack. It nearly touched the little boy and he rolled over backwards. The mother screamed, ah! Run to the car! shouted the father. They all ran. They jumped into the car, they drove and they did not look back. So they did not see the great iron head square like a bedroom with red glaring headlamp eyes and with the tablecloth 
still with the chicken and the cheese draped across the top of it, rising up out of the hillock as the Iron Man freed himself from the pit. Ooh, some lovely pictures. There he is, climbing out the pit. When the farmers realised that the Iron Man had freed himself, they all groaned. What could they do now? They decided to call the army, who could pound him to bits with anti-tank guns. But Hogarth had another idea. At first, the farmers would not hear of it, least of all his own father, but at last they agreed. Yes, they would go ho give Hogarth's idea a trial. And if it failed, they would call in the army. After spending a night and a day eating all the barbed wire for miles around, as well as the hinges he tore off gates and the tin cans he found in ditches and three new tractors and two cars and a lorry, the Iron Man was resting in a clump of elm trees. There he stood, leaning among the hu amongst the huge branches, almost hidden by the dense leaves, his eyes glowing a soft blue. The farmers came near, along a lane, in cars so that they could make a quick getaway if things went wrong. They stopped fifty yards from the clump of elm trees. He really was a monster. This was the first time most of them had had a good look at him. Excuse me. His chest was as big as a cattle truck. His arms were like cranes and he was getting rusty, probably from eating all the old barbed wire fence. Now Hogarth walked up towards the Iron Man. Might be able to do this in one video today, guys. Hello! He shouted and stopped. Hello, Mr. Iron Man! The Iron Man made no move. His eyes did not change. Then Hogarth picked up a rusty old horseshoe and knocked it against a stone. At once the Iron Man's eyes turned darker blue, then purple, then red, and finally white, like car headlamps. It was the only sign he gave of having heard. Mr Iron Man, shouted Hogarth, we've got all the iron that you want, all the food you want, and you can have it for nothing, if only you'll stop eating our farms. The Iron Man stood up straight. Slowly he turned till he was looking directly at Hogarth. We're sorry that we trapped you and buried you, shouted the little boy. We promise that we won't deceive you again. Follow us and you can have all the metal that you want. Brass too, aluminium too, and lots of old chrome. Follow us. The Iron Man pushed aside the boughs and came into the lane. Hogarth joined the farmers. Slowly they drove back down the lane and slowly, with all of his cogs humming, the Iron Man stepped after him. These beautiful pictures. I love it. They led through the villages. Half the people came out to stare, half ran to shut themselves inside bedrooms and kitchens. Nobody could believe their eyes when they saw the Iron Man marching behind the farmers. At last they came to the town, and there was a great scrap metal yard. Everything was there. Old cars by the hundred, old trucks, old railway bridges, old stoves, old refrigerators, old springs, bedsteads, bicycles, girders, gates, pans. All the scrap iron of the region was piled up in there and rusting away. There, cried Hogarth, eat all you can. The Iron Man gazed and his eyes turned red. He kneeled down in the yard, he stretched out one elbow, picked up a, a greasy black stove and chewed it like toffee. There were delicious crumbs of chrome on it. He followed that with a double-decker bedstead and the brass knobs made his eyes crackle with joy. 
Never before had the Iron Man eaten such delicacies. As he lay there, a big truck turned into the yard and unloaded a pile of rusty chain. The Iron Man... Apologies, baby, kept me up last night. The Iron Man lifted a handful and let it dangle into his mouth. Better than spaghetti. So there they left him. It was Iron Man's heaven. Look at him. <laughs> the farmers went back to their farms. Hogarth visited the Iron Man every few days. Now the Iron Man's eyes were constantly a happy blue. He was no longer rusty. His body gleamed blue like a new gun barrel. And he ate, 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 ate endlessly. And that is the end of chapter three. Hopefully in one video and hopefully you'll be able to re listen to it before lunch. And tomorrow we'll be reading The Space Being and the Iron Man. That will be chapter four. Have a lovely day, be good for your adults, and hopefully see you tomorrow. Don't forget to let me know that you've read it, and hopefully, fingers crossed, enjoyed it. Bye-bye.